In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great gifts, sacraments of penance, and everything of the sick. Help us to understand your gifts that you've given to, to us in them, and to use them wisely and well. We ask this through our Mother as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the last few weeks we've been discussing Ten Commandments. We discussed morality and sin, and now comes how do you get healed from the sin? How do you do when you, you realize you've fallen away from the Ten Commandments when you've failed? And so hopefully the lesson will pull together a number of different things that we've learned in the past, a number of different things um, over time. So let's kind of spend a second or two reviewing um, some of the things we've talked about in the past. Remember, God created the heavens and the earth and all the contain. He's the creator who made things freely. He made this for his glory and for our good, helping us know who he is, helping us to love him. And then God placed our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the garden. And he said to them, I'm going to feel, feel you grace and blessing. I'm going to have you choose my plan. You can have a, a choice to say yes to me or say no to me. In a very real sense, then, God deliberately left the room and finished. And says to us, I want you to finish it for me, you to work with me, you to help me make this world, this universe, and yourselves be good and holy to reflect me better. But Adam rejected God and refused to go. And so he passed on to us not those graces and benefits, but sin and suffering and death. Now it's hard for us to know God, hard for us to follow him, hard for us to know what God wants us to do. And fortunately to this, each of us has added our own personal sins. Our own personal rejection of God's plan and God's will. Each of us, to some degree, have rejected God's plan, have turned away from God, have sinned against Him, have placed um, in our hearts not God, but things instead of Him. Sometimes the venial sin, sometimes the mortal sins. But God looked with pity, and as soon as, as we had fallen away, God promised to save the Redeemer. And He came and, and lived for us and died for us, and through baptism, we become the sons and daughters not just of Adam, but of Christ. And through Christ to receive grace. But here's the thing. We pray in the creed, I believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. So baptism can't be repeated. It can't be renewed. Only one baptism. Part because of the character. The mark and the seal put upon the soul. So what happens to people who sin after baptism? How are we forgiven of our sins, healed of our sins? What are those who sin in very serious ways? Those who murder, those who fall away. Adultery. Well, God's love and His mercy extends even to this rebellion. And God has given us in the great sacrament of confession for the healing for the sins we commit after baptism. And so Tertullian, who lived in the second century, calls confession the second plank after shipwreck. The shipwreck would have been the original sin, the sin of Adam and Eve. The first plank is baptism. If you let go of that first plank and are sinking in the waves, God sends you a second plank, and the confession and penance, to help make sure you don't die and sink beneath the waves. And so we read in the Gospel of John, after the resurrection, Jesus said to them, the apostles, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. So this then is the framework we need to understand the sacrament. The sacrament begins with an interior 
repentance, an interior penance, an interior sorrow for sin. Sin cuts us off from God. To order to enter into his house through his friendship again, we must get rid of our sin and repent and come back to union with him. So God expects us to turn from sin and turn back to him. God expects us to as best we can with his help to remove from our hearts what is evil, to remove from our wills what is evil. So interior penance consists in turning to God sincerely and from the heart and hating and detesting our past transgressions. Having a firm resolution of our amendment of life, hoping to obtain pardon them through the mercy of God. Accompanying this penance, like inseparable companion of the detestation of her sin, is a sorrow and a sadness of the soul. So the interior penance, the detestation of our sins, wanting to repent, return back to God, leads to an exterior penance. In this case, the sacrament. Because it's a penance, and the repentance that's manifested in an outward way, spoken form, done in an external way. The Catechism of Trent gives us kind of five steps, at least having this interior repentance, this interior conversion of our sin. First, it always begins with God's grace. We can't even begin a good work without God's grace. But always is the one who helps us to begin it. This leads us to cling to him in faith. We recognize that we've sinned against him, who he is, what he is. First, we recognize who he is and what he is. Then we uh, have a fear of judgment. We recognize we've sinned. But it can't end there because then we have to have hope in God's mercy. And then finally, we end in charity. Love of God in time with his children. And this leads to then the interior sorrow for our sins, recognizing we transgressed against God. And we now hate that sin. St. Ambrose says there are two conversions in the church conversion of water, conversion of tears. The conversion of water is baptism, the conversion of tears is confession. So to return to God, we have to recognize we've sinned. Until you recognize you've fallen from God, you're not going to return to Him. Not with the effort to come back. So this is actually a gift from God to recognize we've sinned, to realize that we've fallen short of Him. Because this is how we can begin repentance. Cardinal Stafford, about quite a few times in, in this lesson, is the major penitentiary of the Vatican. Um, that means he's one of the priests, the, the cardinals, who sent to work in, in the Curia in Rome, um, especially for those who are seeking repentance, especially those who are major sinners. He's meant to help um, talk about and speak about confession and bring people to confession, the sacrament, and help deal with, help deal with the sins that are, are especially grievous, the people who need to repentance in, in a public way. But he says there's been a decline in the sense of sin. In our culture and world today, we deny responsibility for sin. We don't recognize our need for sin, we recognize our need for repentance. And until we recognize how we've fallen short of God's grace, our need for a salvation, we're not going to recognize the gift of the Savior, we're not going to recognize we be able to come back to Him. So this interior repentance is a reorientation of our whole life, coming to God. The confession, the sacrament, like all the other sacraments, is prepared for in the Old Testament, promised in the New, and finally given to us by Christ. So it's prepared for um, in the Old Testament priesthood. They would offer sacrifices for sins. The most striking example of this, in my mind, is the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. 
when the high priest went to the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctuary of God, only he and only he alone this one day of the year, bearing the blood of the sacrifice, and would sprinkle it inside as a way of asking God for repentance. And then symbolically, the sins of the people and the priests would be placed upon the head of a goat, and the goat would be set off to die in the wilderness. So get the word scapegoat from it. This was the sending off of a goat, taking the sins of the nation away. But Jesus doesn't just repeat the Old Testament. So confession can't just be a simple, can't just be a reminder, can't even be just a pleading for confession, for forgiveness. It has to be real active forgiveness. Otherwise, the priesthood and the gift that Christ gives us is no different than what happened to the Old Testament. It must be different. And so he promised this when he said to Peter and then to the apostles, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So you find this for the first time in Peter in Matthew 16, 19. And in later to all the apostles in Matthew 18, 18. At the Last Supper, uh, he, he gave the priesthood. He said, this is a memory of me. Finally, after the resurrection, he said to the apostles who were before him, John, who sins you, who sins you forgive are forgiven, whose sins you retain are retained. So the church is the power to forgive sins. Also the power to refuse to forgive sins. We'll talk about when that might be later. And that judgment will be ratified by God. In order to know whether they should, should forgive and absolve the sins, or not absolve the sins, the priest has to make a judgment. Has to be able to ascertain the state of soul of the person. Has to be able to know what they've done. So the confession is a kind of tribunal, a kind of judgment seat. And like every judgment seat, you have to know the crime before you can make a judgment. But the judgment seat, not for the punishment of crime, but for its forgiveness. All the sins of mankind are included in this judgment seat. The Lord says, whatever sins you forgive, whatever you buy on earth, not most of what you buy on earth, some of what you buy on earth, but whatever. And so the whole scope, any sin, can be forgiven by the church. To deny the universality of the church's power to forgive sin, is to deny the words of Christ himself. Some people will say, well, well, okay, maybe it was the end of the apostles given to Peter, but not to everyone else, not to the successors. And like the uh, response of St. Passion, who lived in the year 390, he says this, perhaps the power was given only to the apostles, and to them alone it was permitted to baptize, them alone granted to give the Holy Ghost confirmation. Them alone was granted to remove the sins of the world. For these were ordered none but the apostles. If therefore we recognize the power to baptize, we can all do, and the power to confirm, the, apostles, the bishops can do, we also have the power to bind and to loose, to forgive sin. Let's talk for a moment then about what forgiveness means. Because the forgiveness of God and the forgiveness of man are very, very different. I'm going to begin with a, a gospel story from Mark. A leper came to Jesus, kneeling down, begged him and said, If you wish, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand, touched him, and said to him, I do will it be made clean. The leprosy left immediately, and he was made clean. So Jesus does something no human being can do. You have to go back to understand the understanding of leprosy. See, leprosy was so contagious, so dangerous, 
that those who contracted the disease were cut off from their family. If you had leprosy, you had to go throughout the streets crying, I'm clean. So people could avoid touching you. You were seen to be a public sinner because any disease they was seen to be a punishment from God. So obviously you deserve this punishment. No one would touch you. In order to get food, you'd beg by having a long pole with a bag at the end of it. So you'd stretch out to the people, hoping they put food into it or money. You're cut off from your family, your friends, your house. You were cast out into the streets. That was leprosy. Christ comes and touches the leper. In the Old Testament, if you touched a leper, you became unclean, just like a leper was. When human beings get caught up with sin, or with dirt, we get dirty. But God comes and he touches sin and death, and he heals it. God tells us what's unclean, it becomes clean. So where God is, there's holiness. Where God is, there's life. Where God is, there, where God is, there's healing. Original sin destroyed mankind. It hurt, it wounded it. Cut off the four harmonies. And Jesus comes to forgive our sins. He became our man to literally touch our infirmities, to heal them, to enter into them, and by his death transform them. When we forgive somebody, they might still be in their sins. They might reject our forgiveness. They might still hate our guts. They might still be our enemies. Not so with the forgiveness of God. You see, the forgiveness of God cures and heals sin. <clears throat> Because as human beings, it's more of something, this interior attitude we have toward them. But <coughs> God's forgiveness changes them. That's why the Jews said, Who but God can forgive sins? The forgiveness of God floods the soul with His grace, gives it His life, unites it with God. Remember, grace is that participation in the life of God, bringing us into the intimacy of the Trinitarian life. So the grace makes the person be, truly be, just. For being in a state of sin, we enter into a state of holiness. For being in a state of deserving of hell, we will enter heaven. And through Jesus Christ, in a very real sense, we can even say we deserve heaven. We've earned heaven. Through Jesus Christ. Only through him. Justification, this forgiveness, detaches man from the sin which contradicts the love of God and purifies his heart of sin. It reconciles man with God, it frees him from the enslavement of sin, and it heals. So we come to confession, this is the forgiveness that we're seeking. This is the gift offered to us, this is what God is doing to our souls. Every sacrament has matter and form. The stuff of the sacrament and the words that God uses to make it the ordinary to elevate to, to his grace bill. But confession's a little different. Because confession has no external matter, no stuff applied to the soul, applied to the body, that is, which gives grace to the soul. Rather, the acts of the penitent are as the matter. These human Acts of sorrow and repentance elevated by grace to become supernatural, to become the matter of the sacrament. And the absolution, the forgiveness of sins through the words of the priest, is the form. I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The three acts of the penitent, we'll discuss these in more detail later. There are three of them. Sometimes we divide them into four. Or contrition. I divide it into four because contrition, if it's if real contrition, is going to include um, a desire to amend your life, an examination of conscience. Because people will, will, will say amendment of life is a different one. But contrition, understanding means amendment and a real examination of what you've done, be one of the acts. The second is confession. 
and the third is satisfaction. We'll discuss these in more detail in a minute. The heart of the form, the heart of the absolution, are the words of the priest, I absolve you. Additional words have been added by the church to make clear what's occurring. So the complete form is God the Father in mercy, the death and resurrection of His Son, has reconciled the world to Himself and set the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. It administrates the church, my God, give you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In emergency, just the last phrase would be used. Well, not the whole thing. Um, I've included in there, I'm not going to read this for the sake of time, but I included in there a meditation by Cardinal Staff, where he goes through and breaks apart each of the words, each of the phrase, each of, of the parts of, of the absolution. And it's worth reading, it's worth um, looking a close look at. But that will not be here because of the sake of time. It's a couple pages long. Instead, we're going to go forward now and look at, in detail, the different acts of the penitent, what they mean and why they're important. So the first is contrition. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church, quoting the Catechism of Trent, says this, Contrition is sorrow of the soul, the detestation for the sins committed, together with the resolution not to sin again. The Catechism of Trent breaks us apart and looks at each of these detail, need detail. And so first, you detest what you've done. So you recognize we offended God, recognize you've rejected Him. And we're going to detest our sins even if we know we've been forgiven from them. It doesn't matter how long it's been, we're always going to say that that shouldn't have been done. I'm not going to, that those things don't, don't appeal to me. I don't want to do those things. But even if we never committed them, we should test the sins. This is not necessarily mean an emotion. It doesn't mean you have to have a flood of sorrow or tears. Or there can be good things and gifts from God. But fundamentally it means an act of the will of choice. A recognition, a judgment saying, this is not good. I wish I'd never done these things. I wish to never do these things. The contrition must be supreme. For the exact, the exact same reasons that you recognize that God is supreme, that His love, He deserves everything, because He's the greatest of all things, therefore He's the greatest love. But the exact same reasons are going to say, that therefore what keeps me from God, and what offends Him, is the greatest evil. As God's the greatest good, the greatest evil is going to be what rejects him. And so the judgment, this contrition says, my sin is truly evil. And so I'm going to put it, my judgment, before my own life, my health, my wealth, my comfort, my own urges, knowing that God comes first. We also should need to have contrition for everything committed, as for parts of them. Just a little clarification. Again, because this is not an emotional attachment, Thomas Aquinas said it's not helpful to try to put yourself in a situation and say, well, if I were to be tortured and threatened to be shot, or kids are going to be shot, would I be willing to not tell a lie? He says, look, we're human beings, and by fear and by sorrow, it overwhelm us. That's not the point. But are you able to say, this is my judgment, ideally, hopefully, I wish I would do these things. Then you have the proper contrition, you have the proper sorrow, proper judgment. And I don't have to say, emotionally, which, which is going to affect me more. If someone, if a friend dies, I might be, I might be cry more over that than whatever my sin. Probably. Not the point. The point is, in your judgment, in your will, in your choice, what are you wishing to do, what are you wishing to follow? So three things are involved in contrition. Hatred for sin, which means every sin committed. A desire and resolve to both confess and to repay for the sins. So admit them publicly, admit them, especially to God. 
and then try to repay for them as we can. And finally, to change our lives to the core that we realize we've done. Contrition can come under two different reasons. If it's for a truly for the love of God and for His sake alone, it's called perfect contrition. If it's due to for fear of hell and recognize that the sin is vile, it's called attrition, imperfect contrition. Attrition is good enough for the confession. Perfect contrition actually forgives even mortal sin outside the confessional. However, perfect contrition, true perfect contrition also includes the desire and the resolve to go to confession. So it's not separate from, it's not like there's two different ways to be forgiven, perfect contrition or confession. A perfect contrition will necessarily lead to one to confess, lead to one to, to go and enter the tribunal of Christ. But it means in God's mercy when we cannot um, for whatever reason, confess to a priest. Where the hope, all hope is not lost for us. And that perfect contrition itself is a gift and a grace from God, which he gives, gives us his life and his love and his charity. Two more th elements of this means we're going to forgive those who injure us because of God's sake, as you pray in the hour, Father. And also, um, I'm sorry. One thing is, is uh, after this. That was it. Uh, so contrition is necessary because we have to be, be sorry for what we've done and be willing to seek forgiveness from, from our friend. The second act is confession. This is perhaps one of the most difficult parts for many people. Um, well, sure, I'm sorry for my sin, and, but why have to tell the priest? Why do you have to go and admit it? Why do you have to go and talk about it? This is a part of the way we're made, part of what's necessary for us. Even for human natural reasons, confession's good. In the same way that saying, I love you out loud deliberately is good, but who is saying, I hate these things out loud is good for us. Even a human natural level. But in addition, we're doing a couple other things. We're honoring the incarnation of Christ. Because we're coming to confess to a human being who stands in the place of Christ and who acts on his behalf. We see the obligation for a confession by the mere fact that this is the way Christ established it. If Christ told his priest to forgive sins, and in order to forgive sins, they have to know the state of the soul and what's been done, They have to be confessed to. They have to understand and know what's been done. So this is the way Christ established it. It would be vain to seek another way of forgiveness. The word confession doesn't just mean confession of sins, but by our confession of sins, we're also recognizing God's mercy toward us and God's love for us and His holiness has been offended by our sins. So the mere fact that we're confessing our sins, we're also acknowledging our faith, God's love for us, and God's mercy for us. So what do I have to confess? We have to have a complete confession. Every mortal sin must be confessed. Every mortal sin in and of itself is, is enough to keep us from God. That's why it's called mortal. And so if I only confess two of my three mortal sins, but deliberately keep back another one, I can't reconcile to God. None of, them, none of them are forgiven. Because forgiveness automatically means that grace holds us in union with Him. And as one keeps us away, none can, can bring us to Him. If you've taken arsenic and cyanide and some other kind of poison, it doesn't matter if you have got the antidote for the cyanide. Arsenic is still going to kill you. So if you've confessed and you've really held back one of your sins liberally, only not of your sins forgiven, you've also committed sacrilege and have entered one more mortal sin. You also have to confess circumstances that change the sin. So it's one thing to tell a lie, 
Another time a lion court under oath. Another use of the liquid to get someone killed. And so if, you, if you've deliberately lied under oath to get someone killed, and you say, get follow out a total lie, well, you have to really confess that sin. You have to confess enough that, they don't, that the priest knows what you're talking about. You don't have to confess venial sins, actually. Venial sins can be forgiven in other ways. It's good to confess. It's helpful to confess, but not necessary. For a confession to be valid, some sin has to be confessed. And if you're a very holy person, um, and you come to a confession one day, you can't remember a single sin, sin, sin that's last time you made a confession, you still want the grace, well, guess what? You're in luck. You can tell the priest, I'm here, I, don't, I can't remember anything I committed recently, but I still want the grace of the, of the sacrament. Here's something that I did in the past I've already confessed. And that the bringing forth the sorrow of the contrition is enough for God to, to infuse with his grace and the healing once more of other parts of your life of your sin. So obviously you want to confess in a simple way, confessing uh, completely. The obligation is actually very, very slight. The obligation for confession is you must confess your mortal sins once a year. But why do you want to wait that long? I mean, you're going to get really bad habits. Now you still have to go to Mass, you still have to do other stuff, but at least once a year you have to go to confession. It's much better to go more often, but at least once a year after you've attained the use of reason. Satisfaction. Now, sin does several things to us. Not only does it sever the relationship between God and man, and between human beings, it also works evil into the world. It means we owe God the honor and glory we robbed him. It deforms the soul of the sinner. And so repair, reparation, satisfaction is needed. So this satisfaction, this reparation, this repair is needed even after there's been the forgiveness. An example I use, I teach sometimes, is I say, look, if I had to be angry at you, and I were to go to your house and smash your computer in anger, an apology is a good start, a necessary thing, but it can't end there. I have to make up for that, I can pay back for the stuff I broke. And so when I have sinned, the forgiveness, the apologies, is the confessional. But there's often a lot more stuff going on. As a matter of fact, satisfaction is demanded by the justice of God. God's forgiveness isn't just winking away at our sense, it doesn't matter, forget about it, don't worry about it. No, God's justice demands repayment. The difference is, he's had a son to make repayment for us, because we're going to do that. But his death on the cross doesn't get rid of our free will, get rid of our part in this repayment. As a matter of fact, the death on the cross is the means through which we're able to make satisfaction in the first place. And so God gives us the grace to then let our small offering or small sacrifices take on meaning and value, be able to repair what we've done. So, the sacrifice of Christ lets our sacrifice, our re reparation, take on value. Sin wounds the soul and separates it from God. The sacrament unites us to God, but there are often wounds that have to be dealt with. Especially some very personal sins. Um, I think of an abortion, for example. You know, the woman's committed an abortion might be forgiven of her sins, She'll have a lot of psychological issues, a lot of emotional issues, a lot, a lot of very personal damage she's done to herself. It has to be healed and dealt with. Some of these are this personal, psychological, emotional. And some of them get placed in a debt to God. This is called temporal punishment. And this is why the priest gives us a penance due, a satisfaction. Now, the amount of penance the priest does is not the amount due to our sin. We can't make them, that up. That's, that's only done by, by Christ. And nor is it about how difficult it is. So the priest gives you a light penance or something that, that you've done that's really bad. It doesn't mean that your sin wasn't bad. It just means that the amount of penance is what your way of sharing the work of Christ. The way of joining in his reparation for the world 
and it's cleaning up the world and healing the world. And so if we truly detest our sins, we're also going to detest the effects of our sins and what our sins have done. And so we're going to want to make satisfaction. And that's why contrition includes the desire for confession and the desire for satisfaction. The Council of Trent um, says that any kind of penance can be reduced to three different kinds. Prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Um, and so this is because they correspond to the three kinds of goods we receive from God. The goods of the mind, the goods of the body, and the goods of uh, the external goods, the goods of the soul, the goods, the goods of the body, and the goods of uh, things like money and land and wealth. They attack the world, the flesh, and the devil. They help prepare those who have sinned against. They help um, all the various afflictions. I can also choose to do voluntarily judicial penance for my sins. <coughs> now, there are certain times and places where we're required to do penance for our sins. At the confessional, Good Friday, Ash Wednesday, the Fridays of Lent, every Friday of the year, to a lesser extent. But throughout the year, throughout our lives, we should be have some kind of repentance and sorrow for our sins, some kind of union with God. Part of the satisfaction will also mean if I've robbed from somebody, if I've taken something from somebody, I have to give it back. So if I steal from someone, go to confession, with no intention of making repayment, I'm not really sorry for what I've done. If I can't do it, if it's impossible, I need at least to make some kind of token repayment. We talked about this last week. But the desire is going to be to repair what I've done. So what are the effects of the sacrament? Well, it forgives all sin. You know, venial sin. It removes some of, the, some of the debt of sin. Some of the temporal punishment is called. It gives me the grace to avoid sin in the future. I want to speak as well, real quick, about the seal of the confessional, which is a gift to God to help us have faith and be able to confess. The church has imposed the command of secrecy at silence upon the priest. It's forbidden for the priest, even under danger of death or grave harm to himself, to reveal anything here in the confessional. The only exception, the only exception, would be if it's privately to the penitent upon his request and for his own good. So, for example, if after confession someone comes up to me and says, Father, I forgot what you gave me for my penance, could you remind me? I'm able to tell him. I can't tell his, his mom. I can't tell his little brother, only the penitent. No matter what's been said, no matter what's been confessed. Even if, in the confessional, um, the sin wasn't forgiven for some reason. If there was no confession, there's no, no contrition, no sorrow, no willingness to repent. And I have to see the whole absolution. I still can't say, oh, well, I, I, I can say whatever, I, I, I still can't spout off the sin. And the reason for this is the nature of the sacrament. In the confessional, the priest does not stand there as a human being. He stands there in the place of God. The person is confessing to God. And the person is revealing to the priest something that no angel, no human being can know and has a right to know without being told personally. The inner, the inner um, secrets of his conscience. This is something only known to God, to the person. And so revealing the conscience to the priest. The priest receives knowledge for one purpose only, that is to help heal them of their sins. And so he only has the knowledge, only given the knowledge for one purpose, and one purpose only, and that is the confession. And so to use it in any other manner or any other means is to, is to destroy the confidence and just to, destroy, to commit grave sacrilege. I had a bunch of different questions um, for clarification. Yeah, I'm going to skip those for the sake of time. I encourage you to read them on your own. So how do you make a good confession? Well, you begin by begging the help of God. Asking for His grace and His light and to know what you've done, to recognize our sin, to confess them truthfully. Then we examine our consciences. We, we think of what we've done, 
especially remember the borderless sense, the circumstances, the number. Then we try to bring ourselves a true sorrow, begging for Christ from the gift of having real sorrow for our sins. We're truly contrite. That means deciding what to say in the future and thinking about how I'm going to avoid it. You know. So the occasions of sin. Next, we have to confess our sins with the proper clarity. Confessing our sins according to kind and number, what we've done, how many times we've done it, all our mortal sins. And confessing it neither too much detail or too little. So the priest knows what's been done. And we accept the penance by the priest, forming it immediately if possible. And then we should thank God for his mercy and his forgiveness. I want to um, as well talk about, I don't want to the sick real quick. Before I do so, are there any questions? Anything pertaining to confession from the sacrament? Okay. So in his mercy, God has given us an additional sacrament for healing of our sins after baptism. And this is the anointing of the sick. Also called extreme unction. And it's used for those who have, or at the point of death, or in danger of death. And so often, it should be used, ideally with the sacrament of confession, with the whole Eucharist, not by the people later. Remember, death entered the world throughout. Through the death of Christ, death's been transformed. Now death is not just the entrance to hell, but the gateway to heaven, entrance to life. So we should remember that death is the last moment um, we're able to come to God, able to be with God, able to repent of our sins. The last moment, our chance to cling to God and choose Him. And to keep this in mind is actually a good thing. It's not, not macabre or horrible, but saying, I recognize the point of my life, the goal of my life, and I recognize the final exam, as it were, is going to happen at this moment. And so Christ has given us this sacrament to help us. There are hints in the gospel, but it's Spoke of, promulgated, told the church by James. So the principal parts of the sacrament are the laying on of hands and the anointing with oil, which is the matter, and the form is the prayer of the priest. As the priest will first lay hands upon the head of the, of the person who's in danger of death in silence. He'll take a little bit of oil on, on his thumb. And he'll say, this whole, he notes the, the forehead, this holy anointing, that the Lord has love and mercy, help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. And upon the palms of the hand, he'll make another, two additional signs of the cross. And he'll say, the Lord who frees you from sin, save you and raise you up. Oil is for healing, oil is for strengthening, oil is for um, refreshing. You know, just think of the time you put a hand cream and your hands are dry and chapped. You put things like so the oil in the hand cream shows that it's medicinal, it gives healing and strength. The oil upon the body, on the forehead, upon the hands, is for the healing of sin and the effects of sin. The main purpose of the sacrament is to unite the dying person with Christ dying on the cross. It's a moment of final consecration to Christ and saying, I'm going to enter into his death and his life. I'm going to rise with him at the end. The purpose of it is to give strength to us when we're one of the weakest, when we're the most afraid, when we're feeling the most alone, when it's hardest to resist temptation to sin. God comes and says, I'm going to give you the strength for the sacrament to resist sin, to resist temptation, to help you to die gracefully, to die in my grace. And it helps unite the, the, uh, the sick person to the church, saying they're able to offer and join in their, in their sacrifice, their suffering, for the sake of their brothers and sisters. It forgives venial sin and the effects of sin. It helps uh, heal some of the wounds. And there's additional mercy. If through no fault of their own, the person cannot go to confession. They're unconscious. 
The anointing of the sick will also heal more, forgive mortal sins. If they can, to go to confession. And if they would have gone to confession had they been able to. The Lord says that willingness to be, to be willing to go is enough for me to, me to work in your soul. And so the anointing in that case will take care of even moral sins. The anointing is for those in danger of death. Illness, old age, or, or some wounds. That's what we can give for, for a serious surgery. But not for those who are going on a dangerous journey or who are uh, going to battle. But danger of death needs to be explained. Because danger of death doesn't mean they're going to pass away any second now. It means the first moment we realize this is close to the end. It's almost only it gets cancer. They're told they have five years to live. That's the time to get anointed, for, anointed the first time. You know, someone has a serious illness. Because to deliberately wait, on purpose to wait until the very last moments of death, what you're saying is you're not going to be prepared to receive it in the same way. You're not going to have the strength of your illness during your suffering from Christ. You're not going to have the strength of mind to confess your sins well. So to deliberately to wait until they're cut up seconds from death, if it's on purpose, is a grave sin. Because you're also pre presuming on God's mercy. So you can receive the sacrament several times in the course of the same illness. So if you're if you have cancer, get anointed. A few months later, you go to down downhill, get anointed again. You recover for a time, get sick again, get anointed again. Right before you die, get anointed again. It's, re it's repeated at the times when there's a change in your health and a recognition of the, of the danger. Because Christ says, I'm going to be with you and walk with you in your suffering, your loneliness, and your fear. So you're not alone, you're not, you're not by yourself, but I'm with you. And because it's for those who have sinned after death, or after baptism, excuse me, for those who have sinned after baptism, it's not given to infants or those who never have the use of reason because they can't sin. It's the baptism has killed all their sins and then they remain in the grace of God forever. Um, so the, you went to an infant. At the end of one's life, one's given not just anointing, but a whole triage of sacraments, confession and first Holy Communion. Communion is given the name Viatical, which means with you on the way. If you think of your Spanish, via te cu, with you on the way. This is Christ accompanying the Christian on their last final journey. The word actually takes it, in very interesting history, it takes its name from the food given to a soldier in the Roman army when they were going to go on a mission from which they were expected not to return. So if this Roman soldier knew that he was going to carry a message to an, an enemy who was going to kill him, most likely, he'd be given his viaticum, a one-way meal, his last meal. And the people would say, this is your last meal, no one expected to return. The church took this and transformed and blessed, elevated the word. Because now our last final mission for our God is our death meeting with Christ. Not expected to return but Christ is going to write the rest at the end of life. And so Christ comes to be our final and last meal. Christ comes to be this healing of us, to be with us in the end. So just as baptism and confirmation of the Eucharist together are the sacraments of initiation, confession, anointing, and the anticum, the Eucharist, are the sacraments of preparation for our heavenly homeland. Any questions? Yeah. I have just a comment. Yeah. Uh, I used to work um, as a hospice nurse. Yeah. And with, with, to be on hospice, you have to be within six months of death. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the hardest points, especially those who are Catholic, uh, one of the Catholics, is to get them to receive the, the anointing. Uh, they call right. it the last rites, and they want to wait until <laughs> the last day, second. Yeah. The last day. And yeah. So, like, for instance, this one man that I had to walk took in a care of, no, no, I'm not ready, no, no. And then uh, then Father O'Keefe, they called Father, and when he was really going, Father O'Keefe got there, he says, I got there just before he had his last breath, you know, but he, we, I asked him, I, I'd ask him every week, you know, are you sure you don't need to call and have Father come over and hear your confession? And, yeah. And uh, especially when you're still, you know, alert. Mm -hmm. He said, right. no, no, I don't want the last rites now. 
Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people think that last rites means you're going to die in a second. Yeah, and, and so they're afraid right. if you get the last rites, you're going to be killed. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> you know, right. um, you will. But you will also, on the other hand, you will find anointing of the sick does work miracles. Um, I'm too, too new a priest to have any personal stories, but every priest who's been a priest for, for a year or two um, will say there have been times when they, they've seen the miracles happen in the anointing of the sick. Well, they're kind of like a miracle story of you know, anointing somebody and their pain went away miraculously. Um, it's not end up dying, but just something that they, a uh, very beautiful story, um, conversion, um, and, and the conversion of the soul. But you will see a time the anointing of the sick will as well, if expedient for the soul, will cause a bodily healing. Um, not all the time, but, but on occasion. So then the uh, unification of these to the great mysteries of the faith. So again, this is for the healing of our souls for baptism to bring us to Christ, to bring us to the Trinity, to reopen the way to heaven after sin. But only possible because of the Incarnation. Confession honors the Incarnation in a special way because the confession to a priest is ministered. And anointing as to his death. The church is the means to which we get the sacraments. And because the church doesn't abandon sinners. So Christ doesn't abandon sinners, not as the church. And always opens her doors to those who are willing to confess their sins to seek forgiveness. The sacraments are necessary for us, especially because of original sin. We're always falling into sin, always falling into weakness. As a confession, heal the wounds of sin, forgive us our sins, and bring us to deeper union with God. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.